Uh, next interview here at the New York uh, Antiquarian Book Fair for April 2012 is Andy Cahan, uh, who is a, a bookseller from various places in this country. I first, <laughs> First time I ever met him, I think, was in Hillsborough, North Carolina. That's right. A long time ago. Um, Andy, uh, to start you off with what I start everyone off with is tell us a little bit about your, your parents, siblings, your early youth, your education. Now take us, give us a biopic uh, through college if you went. Okay. Uh, let's see. My father, uh, my, both my folks grew up in Bensonhurst and um, wanted something green, so they took us out to Ohio when I was five. And my father was a mechanical engineer, and my mother uh, was a librarian, um, public library. So uh, in my immediate family, there were a lot of artists and painters and all, and designers in it. So that was always a big influence. I spent lots of time in New York, going to museums, galleries, and all. So it sort of fit for my later later work. I have a sister uh, who was a potter and uh, given carpal tunnel and all that she changed careers after a while. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, my own education I went to, uh, it took me eight years to do my undergrad because I was bouncing around in the 60s trying to figure out what the hell was going on and um, was living in a garden apartment and got fascinated by the quality of light that came in. And so I borrowed my father's camera, and the next thing I know, I was a photographer. So I have an undergraduate degree in photography and a master's degree in photography. And um, I went back to uh, college to get the master's, mostly because I wanted to print books photographically. So I called up a friend of mine who was on the faculty. I said, Clyde, can I get an assistantship? And he said, sure, come on back, Ohio State. And uh, when I got there, they had just hired a guy to start a laboratory press. So my graduate work when I was 30 uh, was all in uh, photo printmaking mm. and uh, working um, uh, with a Vander Cook and printing books and all. And I was in heaven. Mm. And after that, it was time to earn a living, and I didn't want to teach anymore, so I took up book selling, when specializing was, in photography. When when was this? Uh, 1980. 1980. Yeah. And did you? Uh, where was your first uh, shop? My first shop, uh, actual shop, was in Narberth, Pennsylvania, out on the main line. Mm -hmm. And then I had a shop in um, uh, moved to. Um, North Carolina and opened a shop in Hillsboro where you came in one day with Bill Reese. Right. You were on a buying trip. For change. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was my last shop. I said enough. It was, um, I felt guilty having a shop because people would come in and, you know, innocently they wanted to buy books to read or whatever and I didn't have what they wanted and they weren't interested in what I had so I started working at home and everybody was happy. You know? right. So uh, you've been at it uh, essentially professionally as a professional bookseller since around 1980. I dabbled even before that. Yeah. I, I had a job. Uh, yeah, maybe I bounced around a little bit. You asked for about the college. So uh, between degrees, I was here in New York working as a uh, photographic printer for various photographers. And I got tired of being a darkroom lackey Mm. And I was living in Brooklyn Heights, and there was a, an antiquated, well, a used and rare book dealer there, uh, Sam Colton, I know. Montague Street Books. Sure. Sam, I was a regular habituate, as along with, uh, you know, there was a whole crowd that came in, regulars, including around the corner of Jim Rizek. Yeah. <laughs> well, I knew very well. Yeah. Uh, who I was always told, stay away from Rizek, stay away from, but that's another story. Another day. Uh, I ended up doing some deliveries for him one time. Uh, Sam gave me a job. He said, here, kid, clean my basement, 25 bucks a day. And I said, okay, put it in order. And next thing I know, he says, okay, now go out and sell some of them. Whatever you sell, give me half. And after that, he gave me the key to his warehouse. And 
that's how I got my start in the book business. Wow. Sam was a great guy. He's a terrific guy. There, there are not as many Sam Coltons around as there should be. Yeah. yeah. Lots, of, lots of important booksellers people have never heard of. Yep, yep. And so I'm glad that somebody remembers them. Um, we live in an age of the computer, and uh, my curiosity is always asking uh, booksellers, uh, what pre computer presence you have, when did you start using a computer, uh, what part of your business does it, uh, does it mean to you, et cetera? Well, in 1986, I would, had my shop in Narberth, and I had a premonition, and it said, go to Atlantic City. So <laughs> I took 500 bucks out of the cash drawer and went to Atlantic City, and uh, later that day, I came home with $4,000 and went out and bought a, a computer, my first wow. one. It was a good premonition. The problem was, it was an Epson. Oh, well, I had one. And Epson, after all the problems I had with the uh, back and forth to the shop, they declared it possessed. <laughs> 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 and <Okay>. uh, <laughs> they sent me another computer. But I've been I've been muddling with computers since 1986. Uh, I had a website by, I guess by the time 19, early 19. 94, 95 at the latest, I guess. I mean, it's been a long time. Uh, I'm totally computerized. I now use Macs. They're a little friendlier for me, who's mm -hmm. an idiot with them. So, and I generate, um, you know, electronic catalogs. I, I haven't done a printed catalog. And I did 100, about 100 printed catalogs. And uh, after that, I've been doing just little e-lists. You find, you find that uh, successful? Yeah. From your point of view. Uh, well, since I deal with illustrated material, photography is my specialty, um, it's, it's a lot easier to, do, uh, to illustrate things that way, and it's very immediate, and the kind of books that I primarily deal with are more illustration-driven than text-driven. So it's great. I mean, you know, people can, I can do all kinds of illustrations for them with it, and they can get a better sense of the book from it. So yeah, it's 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 good. So um, you would say most of your business apparently is done through the internet, except that which you do at book fairs. No, no, no. not at all. You do Actually, a lot of quoting. Oh yes. Uh, uh, early on, I was told uh, take a librarian to lunch. Good idea. Yeah, and uh, no, I do a lot of collection development work. That's uh, actually preferable for me. I like still the challenge of doing, you know, I recently was called by a, an institution. They had been given a big collection of uh, 60s and 70s uh, news photos, and they're going to do a big exhibition. Now, they don't even know who the photographers are on many mm. of these things. So they said, okay, we need supplementary material, some to help us identify where these photos, who they did them and where they came from, and the other is to show the time. So that's a challenge for me. So I give them, you know, uh, professional uh, newspaper, uh, professional uh, photojournalist uh, magazines, exhibitions, things like that. It's fun for me. And at the same time, uh, it's a learning experience as well. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not the big money aspect of the business. It's just it's giving something back. It's getting involved. It's uh, it's more gratifying. What percentage of your inventory is visual versus uh, hardbound? Oh, uh, oh. Well, bound material constitutes probably eighty-five percent of my material. I yeah. see. Yeah. Books on photography. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all aspects of photography are what I deal with, and um, as a uh, as an art and as a medium, uh, I have a huge huge collection, which is. Uh, for sale, of course, on, uh, <laughs> on the technical aspects of photography from its inception. I think so. I saw that advertised on the internet recently. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you? Some of the people that we've been talking to are, are regular uh, internet uh, sellers. They put items on on a regular basis. Do you find that to be anything you you're involved with? I, I, at this point, I'm a one-man show. Okay. So uh, I kind of muddle along with it. Uh, 
I suppose, you know, there's always that, well, I could do more routine, uh, but I do what I do. You know, okay. I, I, I think I upload some new books once a week, maybe. It doesn't really make much difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, when you're your own boss, you can, you can do that kind yeah. of thing. It's not like somebody's, you know, driving you to do something. Right. So. Um, again, Andy, some of the people have different ideas about the next question. Uh, for example, what do you think are some of the challenges that we face as booksellers in the next 10 or 15 years? Oof. Uh, well, that's a good question. In some ways, I, mean, I think finding the audience is, I think in some ways we've priced, we've priced ourselves out of a market. Really? In some ways, I think. I mean, I don't think everybody can afford to, uh, we have to be able to invite in collectors on a more modest basis as well. Just so those people that are, you know, they have a passion for the material, they just don't have the pocketbook. And you can't fault somebody if they don't have the money. That's just the way it goes. Uh, but a show like this uh, is not really conducive to beginners. That's if you right. think in terms of the dollars. That's right. Um, how are you doing, by the way, at this show? Is this a good I'm doing all right. Uh, I mean, I've had better shows. Uh, but I, th I always say it's me, not the show. I, hadn't, uh, I had taken 20 years off doing the New York show. Uh, I came back four years ago. Uh, and then now again, I think you have to develop a, a presence again uh, for you know f people to know that you're here, know what you have, um, and the, you know if you show up regularly, I think you build up more clientele with it. How many book fairs do you do on an annual basis? Maybe two, maybe three. Do you do the same ones, or you change around? Uh, I tend to have done the ABAA fairs. I was doing. Uh, up until recently, I was doing uh, pa the Paris show every year. Uh, I've tried some of the German shows, uh, some of the European shows. When I was a little bit more active, I was doing three or four shows a year. I've just never... I, I, I don't know how much you want me to go into all this stuff. Just I, w I, w I enjoyed uh, a great success for a while, be doing uh, sort of riding the upward crest of interest in photography. And I had a uh, huge inventory and a lot of great customers. And I was very active in issuing lists. And quite frankly, I didn't really need to do the shows because I had all the business I needed. Right. And it, you know, it, was, it was easy. And I kind of enjoyed not having to schlep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that is part of it, isn't yeah. it? Isn't it? Um, let me ask you a couple of other questions here. Um, who, in your mind, are some of the great or near great booksellers uh, of our era? And are some of the young people uh, that are coming into the trade, do you see some of them as perhaps becoming really uh, terrific booksellers as they get older? Uh, well, to the first part. There are a number of people who I admire. Uh, I think that they, uh, they have great eyes for material. They're ethical. Uh, they're fair and they're good colleagues. So I can say that on that side. Uh, on, the, on the new people, yeah, I think there's, uh, I've, I've met a few. I met this uh, nice young couple out in California. They're from Portland, Oregon. They deal in punk material. And I know who you mean, yeah. And, and they, they had a real, real vigor for it. And they, they were sweet, you know, and uh, enthusiastic. And I think they had interesting material. They were bring, certainly bringing to the shows material that you didn't see. I mean, they, they had no, no problem showing their material next to illuminated manuscripts. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, they really are kind of the same. They're just of our day. Yeah. Just, and so, just, yeah. you know, I, I think that kind of stuff is good. Uh, I, I noticed that this year at the Colorado Seminar, the uh, featured bookseller is a dealer in rock and roll memorabilia. Right. Uh, which I find kind of interesting myself because 
uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s and never really thinking that far ahead. I never really saw this stuff as being what it is, but apparently there's some really high, high priced stuff. Yeah, well, it, it was major. I mean, think about your own life, the, what, what the influence of rock and roll was. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it's not quite the Wright Brothers, but it, it changed a lot of things. And uh, some of the stuff, the prices are incredible. Yeah. Do you do much in the way of photographs of, you know, these rock and roll icons, Elvis, uh, Beatles? Uh, no, who? but having uh, grown up in Akron, Ohio, uh, my wife uh, is an accomplished musician and holds a gold record. And uh, a lot of my old friends are... Uh, Hall of Famers, uh, uh, Chrissy Hine, we used to, we grew up together. And pretenders. Pretenders, we all used to hang out when we were kids. Um, Devos from Akron. Hell, one of my best friends from high school, his son is this phenom, uh, Patrick Carney in the Black Keys, which is the hottest thing in the, you know. Right you now. can't turn on the TV without hearing their music. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, Akron, uh, Akron's a great place for, for... Who would have that. thunk it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't associate Akron... Akron had to have something, for God's sake. Besides sakes. tires <laughs> and, and rubber. I guess that's what, that's what I would associate right. Akron with. And, and the bookseller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other than that. Frank Klein, absolutely. Yeah. I, I did get to interview Frank. Uh, I don't know how he's doing. Uh, he's doing well. I, I have lunch with him pretty often. He, see he's him. A, he's a nice person. I like yeah. his daughter. Yeah, Andrea and... Yeah, they have a, 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 an iconic shop, in in the, in the sense. Well, if you were starting a book business today, Andy, uh, would you? Could you? Uh, how would you do it? Wow, uh, you know, when I started, I think it was a lot. It's so hard to to always judge. It's like when you're a kid, your parents are always complaining about what you do, and you're always rebelling against your parents. And I think every generation probably whines and moans about the same thing. When I came up, I mean, there were people like Sam Colton who, you know, you gave, gave you a little lift up. And it was pre-internet, which I think made, not everybody knew the secret handshake at that point. Right. And so, you know, if you worked hard, you could develop your own um, knowledge base and not everybody knew it. It wasn't so accessible. It was like, like Ricky Jay in the magic business. Yeah. You know, uh, if you practice your chops, you, you'll you'll do okay. Yeah. And you didn't need a lot of money. Now the last fellow who worked for me wants to uh, try his hand, and I I've said to him, I don't think you need a lot of money. You, I I I hope you don't need to have a lot of money to start, but you just got to work damn hard, and. I think it might be maybe easier to, to be a specialist than a generalist if you're just coming up now. I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've never, I mean, I admire people like Caliban, you know, yeah. great big open shop with all levels of books. Right. But that takes a very special kind of person to be able to do that. And staff. Yeah. Which is, you know, which is an expense yeah. that the people like you and I don't have to worry about. That's right. But then again, you also limit yourself because you're only one person. Right. And, and if you specialize, you limit yourself to just one little piece of the yeah. business. So One subject. You know, you're going to be looking at a million books a year or more, and gee, I'll just take those four. You know, well, that's yeah. a little limiting, too. Yeah, it is. But I, I, I think that as time goes on... Um, Younger booksellers seem to be more visually oriented yeah. than older booksellers. Yeah. Do you find that to be the case? Oh sure, oh sure. Well, Maholi Naj said that back in nineteen, what twenty five. I really? mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, I'm going to paraphrase: um, the illiterate of tomorrow will not know how to use the camera. I mean, that that's. I mean, everything now is is generated through um, through one aspect of photography or another, and it's so it's visual. I mean, all of our printing is done that way now too and in this world of social media and all that yeah I, I, it's all immediate and quick and you and we learn more visually than we do any other way I mean that's our greatest portal is is visual uh, you just mentioned social media uh, do you have a Facebook page not at all, not at all. no thank you 
and do you tweet? No, leave me alone. <laughs> just, just out of curiosity, you, you know, you said social media. I'm oh, I know it goes it on, out. and and I sit there and uh, and uh, uh, I, I I wonder at it, but uh, no, it's not for me. Not for you. No. Um, you recently remarried. I did. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that influence? Uh, yeah, I actually, uh, um, I uh, married, uh, I was her first, this woman, I was her first, Deborah, I was her first boyfriend 42 years ago. <laughs> and out of the blue, I get an email from her saying, gee, I haven't seen you in 30 years, what the hell have you been doing? And so we started uh, talking and writing, and then um, after a while we met, and uh, that's why I'm back in Akron, Ohio. Really? Yeah. 42 years. 42 wow. years. The, I drove her up here in 1971. She was supposed to play bass for Jimi Hendrix as a session musician wow. at Electric Ladyland. So, yeah, I brought her up here for that. And I was, and I saw her, I saw her the last time I'd seen her was uh, here in New York. She and her band were performing at uh, one of the clubs in uh, 1978 or 79. What was the name of her band? Chai Pig. Yeah, yeah it, stand, it was, uh, well, it's a whole thing. Chicken, yeah. chai for chicken and pig for, it was a, uh, named after a barbecue place in Akron. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> well, that'll be yeah. very insular, so. Yeah, Why but it? It, was, it was very good, it has CDs. And these kids I mentioned out in San Francisco, they had one of her posters up in their booth. Really? Yeah, and uh, when she said that's her, they treated her like a god because, you know, Akron Sound, I mean, she, her group was known. Mm. So, And um, the influence on me, yeah, it's a, it's a nice calming one. Yeah. But her job is, uh, she's a magistrate. Oh. She's the uh, chief mediator at family court in, uh, for Summit County. She's so the only mediator, actually, for... That's, uh, uh, domestic issues. That sounds like a, a tough job. It's a very tough job. A lot uh, of stress and strain, I would think. She calls it honorable work. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. I would imagine so. Well, Andy, our 30 minutes have come to an end. Well, I appreciate it's been a pleasure. your participating. And um, I hope you continue in the trade and find some more great photography stuff. Well, thanks. And you. <laughs>